Dum, dum, dum. All right, Dale, put us uh, our song up, maybe? You know, when, you're, when you don't have a song up, you can always... Oh, a child of the king. I like that. Welcome to the summer crowd. Welcome to the, these are the old homeboys. These are the hood. This is the hood. This is the 12 month a year folks. We call them all kinds of things. 12 monthers. Some of you, however, aren't, you're, you're, you're hanging on. I'd appreciate that. Appreciate you hanging on. Some of you, somebody told me they're going back to Minnesota. And uh, even though I told people, don't tell me when you're leaving. Well, they do anyway. They got to tell me. You got to tell me. It's okay. I'm going to cry later. But we appreciate all you 12-month folks or 11-month, however it may work this way out. We appreciate you being here. This is the summertime. We're getting rain. The rain, the rain pattern is starting to form in the evening now. We're starting to have rain at my house. You people on the coast probably don't get any, but we, we get it inland first. Then it begins to work its way over to the coast. And so we're having some nice rain, and things are looking like summer. The, 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 the floating mountains. The floating mountains. Going home last night. I, when I go home, course crew, that's directly east. And what's beautiful oftentimes is that's when I go home at night, the moon. You get a moon rise. Absolutely gorgeous. I don't know if you know this, tonight... There's going to be an eclipse of the moon, one of the bigger ones or better ones, I guess, than they've had in a while. So welcome, Roaches. Good to see the beach people. You sent me a picture. You sent me a couple pictures of a sunset. I'm making a postcard out of one of them. I may need your original pixel, pixel picture, because that was professional. I appreciate you doing that for me. Uh, Anyway, Lord uh, is beautiful. He gives us, you know, in the summertime, we're crying about the northern folks leaving, and we're sad, but then he gives us all this beautiful stuff to look at. And so we get happy again. So the moon rise. Tonight, if, is that, is that uh, obviously if it's moon rise, it's going to be tonight, right? <laughs> what time of night, I don't know, though. I didn't, anybody know the time of that? 11.30? Well, that's late for most of you people. I don't know about you, but I go to bed about 9 o'clock. So when I had COVID, I was, I was going to bed like 7 o'clock at night. I, I got that, you know, I was crazy, crazy. Okay, let number one bring it. Come on out and sing. All right. Stand with me if you would, please. Hope you can sing this this morning. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the in his hands of rubies and diamonds of silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. My Father's own Son, the Savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now He is pleading our pardon on high that we may be his when he comes by and by. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my savior, I'm a child of the king. I think Mrs. Atto and I had different ideas there. But you know what? We it all works up to it all works together it all works together <laughs> you know they say the director is supposed to be the leader but i'm telling you the piano player is the leader of the band the piano player is the leader it's the way it is <laughs> amen all right let's pray heavenly father thank you for your mercy and your grace thank you lord that uh 
that you have uh, taken care of us, met our needs this week. You've been so good to us, Lord, better than we deserve. And uh, you're always good to us no matter what. Uh, thank you for the privilege it is to be able to come here and to, to spend time together. We are able to worship freely, Lord, and your word can be spoken here without hindrance, Lord. I pray for the uh, teachers and the preachers. You give them the uh, wisdom and what they need to be able to present what you want this morning, Lord, and to tender our hearts, prepare us for it. Lord, may you be lifted up and glorified. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Well, thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, greet one another as, you, as Mrs. Zato plays through one more time. Thank you, Mrs. Zato. Life is good. Marilyn Rose, you around? Help her up there. Help her up, brother. She's an old woman. We have some first timers today from Weatherford, Texas. Josh and Lee Merrill. They're sitting right over there on the side. We're glad to have you this morning. And I saw Peggy come in this morning, and she has her daughter with her. Good morning. Good to see you this morning, too. Uh huh. And then uh, Janelle is back. Janelle's been gone for a while, so welcome back, Janelle. So, yeah, glad to have you back, Janelle. Nice to have you. That's it. I was just asking about you. I wonder where she's traveling the world somewhere. That girl's been all over the world, travel like crazy. But there's no place like home. When you step out of the United States, in many cases, you step down. It's just we've been honored to have a great country. A good, we used to have a good government. We're hopefully going to get it back November. I hope you vote and everybody and his brother votes. And that they don't cheat like dogs. Um, I want to read you real quickly about paleontology. This is uh, November 14th on this book, 100, 365 Reasons Have You Considered That the World Was Created? Ask people when dinosaurs died out. You can ask any, go to any university. And when did the dinosaur die out? And they will usually answer about 65 million years ago. Nobody was there to record that, so it's not science. <laughs> you know, as soon as you can't witness and test something, it's really not science. It's not true science. It ha becomes then speculation. It could become their, their theology, their religion, or whatever. But they don't want to call it that. They want to call it science. We saw that during COVID. They called a lot of things science that weren't science, and, you know, all that whole confusion thing. Then they were they, uh, Then why are scientists now finding soft tissues in some dinosaur bones? Um, this doctor, Mary, whatever her last name is, was analyzing the fossilized thigh bone of a T-Rex found in Hell Creek Formation of Montana. Now you may know, Flo may know where that's at, and found, to her amazement, blood vessels, cells with nuclei. Tissue elasticity. Tissue elasticity. I'm losing elasticity and I'm only 70 years old. <laughs> and intact protein fragments. Intact protein fragments. Can these survive 65 million years? No, no. And again, I say no. That's not in the book. Could they have survived since the flood of, of Noah's day? Yes, 4,500 years ago, 4,400 years ago. 
Many studies of Egyptian mummies and other humans of old age show the same sort of detail as this doctor found reported in her T-Rex. Uh, since this doctor discovery, more pa paleontologists are cracking open dinosaur bones and finding to their amazement the same thing. Blood vessels, cell nuclei, tissue elasticity, and protein fragments. Dinosaur soft tissue revealed they did not die out years ago, that many years ago. If these dinosaur bones are mi not millions of years old, then neither is the Earth's rock layers in which the bones were found. Oh, that makes sense, right? The Earth's sedimentary rock strata were formed as sediment filled water deposited layer after layer of sediment during the year long flood of Noah, uh, 4,400 years ago, trapping dinosaurs' remains in the deposits. Dinosaur soft tissue shouts that we live on a young Earth. Dr. Grady McMurtry does a much better job than I've ever heard about the young earth. He's got lots of reasons why he believes in a young earth, lots of them. The sedimentary buildup of the Mississippi River. If the Mississippi River had been running or, you know, how long you'd have a much bigger sedimentary pile into the ocean, stuff like that, big stuff. Uh, the saltiness of the ocean. The ocean seems to be getting saltier, or measurably saltier every year. Well, if you just reverse that, at one time it was fresh. And so... Um, and guess when that comes out? Oh, about the same time the Bible says. So I, I just kind of conclude after looking at all that, the Bible must be true. Yeah, yeah. So God bless. We appreciate Brother uh, Whiff coming off his retirement for us. <laughs> now, now, I don't want you to hold Brother Whiff too accountable because he's in limbo right now. He worked for all those years, was... Uh, he was pulled on by thousands of people wanting his opinion, wanting all that, and he was on the phone all day long. Now nobody wants to call him. <laughs> and he shuts his phone off. Anyways, uh, but anyway, he's, he's still going through the withdrawals of being all that busy and being that responsible to being a nobody like the rest of us. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, we, we kind of got used to it already, you know, but... Uh, we appreciate that. Appreciate you. I gave. I told him five years. He didn't like to hear that. I said, five years, you'll be normal. He said, oh, I think I'm more like two. I said, well, amen. Amen. I'm for it. But I appreciate him taking time to teach here, giving us a little bit of his time in and out as he comes in and out. And so we're glad to have him when he can be here. Before I get down, I got to do the plumber. You have an appointment to see Jeff Larson. Did you already do? You already see him? God bless. See, I'm taking care of you. All right. God bless you. Come on. I don't think we missed anything else. Come on up. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to teach on Sunday mornings. Uh, I appreciate you allowing me to teach you. I mean, this is, a, this is a crowd that knows the book. So it definitely is not something I take uh, lightly. Um, spend a lot of time. Uh, of course, it gives me something to do. Um, but I've been doing this. You know, I've been teaching Bible now. Well, we're coming up on 35 years probably, on and off. Did it more part-time for about 10 years, full-time for 10 years, which five of it was here, and uh, then on and off since then. My job kind of pulled me in different directions, but it's a beautiful thing to be retired, but it's definitely a, a work in progress, a lot to learn, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. And I guess I told pastor, you just got to stay busy somehow, some way, and um the Lord's allowing me to do that. One of the things I do will be, hopefully, uh, Lord willing, teaching the Bible. That's why Eileen and I are planning to stay more often here in Florida than the travel plans we originally had. So we were already talking about coming back in August, but uh, maybe starting in September again, picking up if, if Pastor wants me or needs me to you know, keep, keep going here. So um, anyways, got a lot to cover this morning. Uh, by the way, Jim... You may be the head of the music yeah. program. Yeah. Miss Atto is the neck that turns the head. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm always reminded of that. I may be the head of the home, but Mama's the neck that turns the head. Yeah. Miss Marilyn, by the way, I got to tell you, you're, you're a walking advertisement for Sherwin Williams Paint Company. <laughs> 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 you just, it's a beautiful thing. I was like, man, I. I'm, I'm getting ready to call the marketing department tomorrow. I said, I have got the advertisement. If you want to attract old people, I've got it for you. 
By the way, anybody see the full moon last night? Full moon, beautiful, and which is we talked about last week. We reflect the light of Christ, and the moon is a picture of us, the bride of Christ, and and um, and Christ being the Son of Righteousness. And tonight's the blood moon, so it's a lunar eclipse, but it's a blood moon. So once again, a reminder that every believer reflects the light of Christ because they're blood bought believers. God has a way of just speaking to us through His creation. As Pastor talked about earlier, just so much to talk about. But anyways, if you're going to have a place card today, Matthew 25, Matthew 25 would be a good place. we got a lot to cover. As always, I never finish, and I always end up expanding. I've been trying to shorten our study on the tabernacle. Would you believe that? I've been cutting things out left and right just for, for try to get through this one time in my life. I've had this study uh, done before, uh, but I've never really, I think, I've not, I don't know if I've ever finished it um, in, in a presentation form. And so, this isn't something I just pull out of the archives and just share with you. Every, every, I have so many different notes that probably say the same thing in different ways, you know, at different times, but every time I get into it, I find something more that ex- God wants me to give to, to me and to you. So there is, there is no uh, just, I pull it out of the archive and here we go. This, every week is a unique week and uh, this one is no different as we're going to talk a little bit about the source of the light in the golden candlestick. Something for us to think about. Man, we spoke two, two sessions or two Sunday schools on the light itself, but you've got to be asking yourself, well, where's the source of the light? How did the, how, where did they get the light? It wasn't a burning wax candle. It was the pure olive, the pure oil from the olive that we read last week. And so we're really going to focus our attention on what the oil means as a type of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to teach, but what does that mean for our lives? What, what's the personal application? Uh, but first, some of the doctrinal teachings here is... 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, we saw that David was anointed with oil by Samuel. This was in preparation for him to be king. Now, this was God's anointing on him. That anointing was done with oil. Oil was a picture of the Holy Spirit coming upon him to do the will of God. And we know what followed this is he went to battle with who? Goliath. So, Three times David was anointed, by the way, before he became king. This is the first. The second, I believe, was with the elders of Judah, and the third was with the elders of Israel. Each time was God preparing him to be king. Oil was necessary to do the will of God. Keep that in mind, because it was the power source from God to accomplish what God wanted. And so that's really the theme of today's Sunday School is our power source is the Holy Spirit. And in the case of the Old Testament, the anointing was always connected to oil. And it's the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Old Testament, I think just about everybody here is a Bible student, knows the difference between the Old Testament Holy Spirit and the New Testament. The Old Testament Holy Spirit did not indwell the believer permanently. That was a foreign subject. Christ is teaching His disciples who did not grasp the concept that there would be another comforter, capital C, in John chapter 14, verse 16, that I'm going to give to you, and he's going to be permanent. He will dwell with you forever. That was the promise of the Spirit. And that that promise was to give you the ability, or every believer, the ability to do the will of God. So the Old Testament was a come-and-go ministry of the Holy Spirit. The New Testament is a permanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit. I know you know that. But Pete, when you read verses like Psalms 53 where David says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because God could take that away. We saw the Spirit of God come upon Saul, but then leave Saul, and a demonic spirit filled Saul, which is why he went after David. So you see this ministry of the Holy Spirit and the radical change in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost, which is where really what our Christianity is about. It's the dwelling of Christ in us, in the person of the Spirit of God. And that is our source, as was the Old Testament candlestick. That source of light was the oil 
a type of Holy Spirit, and in the New Testament, that's our power source, the Holy Spirit, to do the will of God, to know the will of God. Here's a beautiful parable about it that Christ shares in Matthew 25, and we're all familiar, most of us are with Matthew 25, is the parable of the ten virgins. And he, and he gives this parable, and he says, hey, there were five wise that took oil in their lamps. And then there were five foolish that didn't take oil into their lamps. So they had a light, somehow they had light, but they didn't have the right oil source, the right source. And so when, the, when it was time for the wedding, the bridegroom went in with the five wise who had the oil. They were uh, given entry into the wedding the, the bri- with the bridegroom, whereas the other five foolish were refused entry. Now what's interesting about that is the word foolish, we, we know in, uh, I think, Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Now I don't believe these folks didn't believe in God. They just didn't believe what God said about what they needed for salvation, so they rejected it. They didn't get the oil, and when it came time for the, they thought they were going into the wedding, and shocked, they're not going in. And that's, really what that parable is about so the five wise ones with oil the holy spirit went in that's why i think jesus used the word oil in the candlestick or their vessels the ref- those that without the oil were refused entry now he says in conclusion of that parable lord lord they say open to us but he answered and said verily i send you i know you not now the lord jesus can never say that to a born again believer those that teach you can lose your salvation, he, he could never say, I never knew you, because that means you would have it, he would know you, and then he wouldn't know you. The Bible's so clear about eternal security. It's amazing when you get a hold of that, grasp that doctrine, it does amazing things for your walk with God and how motivated. They think that if you lose it, that's a motivator. But we know the Scripture teaches you're, you're a permanent, it's permanent. Now God says, because I've done this, hopefully you're motivated to go serve me and love me. And so, here, I know you not. These believers didn't have the oil, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about this earlier in Matthew chapter 7. Interesting, Lord, Lord, these individuals are religious workers. They're all over the world. We know tons of religion. We knock on doors all the time. Oh yeah, I know Jesus. But do they really? And I'll get to that in a minute. Kind of a summary of what that means. But Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Okay. They're, they're preaching. They've cast out devils. And, and the devil can cast out devils for whatever reason. In thy name done many wonderful works. But Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of you that work iniquity. I think the best way to sum this up is in Romans chapter 10. Paul said Israel has, he had a desire for Israel to be saved. I mean, if he could die himself for Israel, he would have. He would have given up his own salvation for Israel to have salvation. That's how much he was passionate about Israel, the Jews having salvation. And he says in verse 2, he says, they have a zeal, have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And he says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness. And as a result, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. That salvation is submitting to the righteousness of God, not your own. Those workers who do the, the wonderful words, works and cast out demons and preach in his name are trusting in their own righteousness to get to heaven. The world is abound with religious workers. This grieves everybody. I mean, when you talk to a Catholic sometimes and they're trusting in their church and in their works and their sacraments and you think to myself, none of that is going to mean anything when you stand before God and you hear those words. Because you have a zeal for God, you'll even work to bone. You'll give up everything for God, but not according to His righteousness. It's, that, it's such a fine line, folks. 
I came out of a works-based salvation as a young man. I didn't know the Lord, and I got, you know, I got involved in Christianity, and I, but I was in a works-based salvation. You know, you, you got baptized, then you did these good works, and then you could lose it, but they could never share to me how I could get it back. And I was, I'd be, I was so confused. And then God, so thankful for one of God's faithful decided to share the Word of God, kind of in my face kind of guy, and said, you need to submit to God's righteousness. He did the work, not you. So I don't have to hear those words, I never knew you. And that's because they didn't have the Spirit of God in doing it. There are the possessors of Christ, and then there are the professors of Christ. And the world is full of professors of Christianity, but they don't possess Christ. They don't have the oil. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid they're going to hear those words and be shocked. This all can be summed up in a New Testament verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It really clearly, this sums everything up. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God, what? Dwell in you. Then look, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his doesn't belong to Christ. He must have the oil, or as I say, Old Testament oil. He must have the Holy Spirit, New Testament. Romans 8. And when you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you, the Bible makes it very clear that we're not only birthed into the body of Christ, but we're members of His body, notice, of His flesh and of His bones. You're not going to get separated from God because you're members of His flesh and of his bones. It's just the, the two shall become one is what that whole verse is about. So it's a beautiful thing to know that. But why is the Spirit of God dwelling in me? Well, we all know it was an earnest for our down payment. It was, it was a down payment for our salvation. And that's a wonderful thing, but it's also the power source to do the will of God. The whole purpose of the Spirit was God giving us something so we can know him we can walk with Him, and we can accomplish something that is pleasing to Him. Because anything we do in the flesh for God will amount to nothing. Zero. Yes, people get burnt out on Christ. You ever hear that? I'm burnt out. I've used that word often, unfortunately. And now, you know when you get burnt out? Because you're, you're doing it in the flesh. At some point, you went from the Spirit to the flesh. Maybe you got tired. And you needed a break, but you didn't take the break. And then you got burnt out, and then the, now you're operating in the flesh. We cannot accomplish the will of God in the flesh. That's why over and over in Scripture, walk in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Why? Because then we accomplish the will of God. So, kind of simplify this. If I can get this up there. The Holy Spirit, represented by the oil in the Old Testament, is the power source to do the will of God. So God's Spirit, His power, is equal to His God's will. Now, I have to do, I have to have the Spirit, reliance on the Spirit to do God's will. But guess what? Now and then, we experience a power outage. Sometimes our circuit breaker goes a little high wire. It happens. Christianity, I wish I had the board over here. Maybe I could do that real quick. Christianity is not a, is not a straight line, nor is it a flat line. If you were to mark life, Christianity is not, it, well, Christianity is full of peaks and valleys, right? But it's not peaks and valleys like this. That would indicate no growth. You got spiritual success, and then you're down in the valley where God's teaching you something. You're not learning up here, typically. You're learning the most right here. Christianity should, be, should look more like this. As an upward, as, a, as you mature as a believer, versus this. That is what Bibles describes in Hebrews 5 as those, those Christians that became dull of hearing. 
They hadn't matured. They hadn't exercised their spiritual senses. So as a Christian, you're going to experience peaks and valleys. When you get into that valley, it's like a short circuit sometimes. You're plateaued. You, you, you don't feel the power of God. You're not, you, you feel like God's not talking to you. Or, or you're just walking in circles like you're not getting anything done with God. You ever been there? If you've been saved long enough, you've been there. And you're going to be there again. Because this is where God teaches you. To learn to depend on Him. When you're in that spiritual success, because you have walked in the Spirit, and you get into that valley, you say, okay, I've got something to teach you, but that's not the time to give up. That's the circuit breaker or the power outage is really you, not the Spirit. The Spirit never goes out. But the Spirit sometimes gets grieved, or sometimes the Spirit just is going to teach you something. And, and so we experience that, but there we learn to depend on God. Now, I, I often refer to that as getting a little stale, the oil's gotten a little stale, it's me. I need personal revival. I've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. When the light gets a little dull, it flickers a little bit, when your light gets a little dim, it's time to plug in. How do you like that, brother? That's a good song. When your light gets dim, it's time to plug in. That'd be a good sermon, wouldn't it? But we all get stale. I, I've been stale. Uh, oh man, Lord, I, you know what I need? I need a fresh oil. Do you know there's a verse in Psalm 92 that says, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. We all need personal revival. That's when we got to cry out to God. God. God knows. He understands that sometimes there's that quietness in our lives and, and, and we're, we're just in a plateau, but that God's just teaching us something. And we got to listen to the still small voice to get us to where we do the will of God. Sometimes not doing anything is doing the will of God. Now, I know that's shocking to some of you. But sometimes we just need to shut up and stop and listen for God to speak to us. We're always like, okay, God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? God says, you don't need to do anything right now, but listen. Quiet. And that's when we sometimes need fresh oil. And God will give us what we need next to do the will of God. As long as we don't get all discouraged and all, you know, depressed and, you know, quit on God. That's not a good place to be. So, in the New Testament, the Apostle John uh, does a wonderful job at tying together this, uh, the oil with the anointing in these verses. Now, it's really interesting. He uses the word unction, and it's the same word we get from anointing. But ye, talking to believers, have an unction an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. By the way, it says that you need not a teacher. Is that a little shocking to you? I mean, you're sitting here, you need a teacher. I need a teacher. I need to be influenced by teachers. But what does he mean? You don't need to, any man teach you is what he's saying. You don't need any man to teach you. But I, I, I do need a teacher. God gave me teachers. But, but what does he mean by it? He's saying ultimately the real teacher in your life is the Holy Spirit. You could sit here and listen to this and whoosh, whoosh, out one in one ear, out the other doesn't mean a thing. Because one, we may not be ready for it, or two, we don't want it. But the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And really, ultimately, I'm just a vessel to minister the Word of God, hopefully, faithfully, and that He takes the Word and the Holy Spirit applies it to your life for what you need. That's the unction that we get. Now notice this, how He ties this together. He says, but the anointing, he doesn't use the word unction this time, he used the word anointing. So the, inter the scripture interprets itself. But the anointing which you have received of him, notice, abideth in you. The anointing, like the oil in the Old Testament, is a person. The Holy Spirit's a person. Now think about that. I had my mother-in-law for the last three days. Some people like to say the mother in grace. So versus mother-in-law, and I, I enjoy her company, but not always. Sometimes she get on my nerves. She's always giving me advice, whatever, it, and that's good. I, that's what good mothers are supposed to do, but enough is enough sometimes, right? The mother-in-law, it's, it's three days. She has an old saying, after three days, the fish starts to smell, and I didn't say it, she did. I did not say that, she did. 
The anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. The Holy Spirit's a person. We have to think of that for a moment. It's not just some electricity. I keep referring to it as a power source, but the power source is a person. I'm walking with a person. That person happens to be Christ in me, in the person of the Holy Spirit. That is radical. When I, every time I go to think about it, I'm like, how in the world do you put up with me? I can't put up with me. How do you put up with me? But he does. And sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit like our mother-in-law. We're just like, ah, come and go, you know. Oh, by the way, hello, Holy Spirit. And then we don't talk to the Holy Spirit for months. When was the last time you talked to the Holy Spirit? Say, I've, I've talked to Christ. I, I get that, but talking to the Holy Spirit's okay. Just be careful that your, your reliance isn't. The Holy Spirit does everything to honor Christ. Everything's to lift up Christ, the Son. But still, he's the person. It's, it's the role he was given, but he dwells in us. He's a person. Like my wife and I, we're supposed to be best buddies. We really are. You know, we've been married for 36 years. 36 years. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've known each other two years prior to that, so, you know, 38 years. And I can say she's still my best friend on this earth physically. I mean, some people, I know a lot of, I know a lot of guys don't retire. I've learned that. You know what? They don't want to be home with their wives. I hate to say it. In the work world, I've seen, you know, I am not retiring. I'm like, man, I've got to spend time with her. You know, I've got to be with her with all day. I actually enjoy it. That, that relationship was, is God sent and God ordained. He made that happen. You know, in the flesh, we probably couldn't stand each other. But God's made it possible in the spirit. And I think of that walk we have together is I need to have a walk with God that's even closer because he's in me. I didn't mean to dwell on that too much, but I just want to remind us that the Holy Spirit is a person. The anointing is a person. That's why he said abideth in you. That person is the Holy Spirit. So, you know, when he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit, here I go preaching, but I can't help it. Grieve not the Holy Spirit it's because he's in you. He's not leaving. So when we fall into sin or we, we have bitterness or anger or whatever it is, we're grieving the Holy Spirit from working through us. Now he's got to work to us to get us straightened out. And that wasn't really what he wants to work through us. So love this power. I call this a power verse. This is a reminder of our reliance on God. I beg God for when I stand up here, this is not about me. Now there's been times where it has been about me. I, you know, I, oh, I, I want people to know, hey, did I do a good job and all? But I've learned, hey, this is about God. I'm just a vessel. I'm not really important other than that purpose that God's given me. And here we see we have this treasure. That's the Holy Spirit in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels that the excellency, get it, the power may be of God and not of us. So the Holy Spirit, when anything gets done for God, he wants it to be the power of God and not the power of man. So, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. That's a good verse to dwell on. God, help me to live a life that's your power, your source of power, and not mine. Because it won't mount to a hill of beans if it's my power. This is the judgment seat of Christ is all about. The work's done in the body. The work was either done by you or it was done by Christ. That which was done by Christ is going to last. The wood, hay, and stubble is that which was done by me for my glory, my honor, my pleasure. And God says, it's going to burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. But anything done for Christ that's in the power of God, by the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit, that is going to be the gold, silver, and precious stones for every believer. And God wants that. For you as a believer us as believers got a couple minutes so this is this is going to tie into the next study we do um, regarding the altar of incense so this is really important kind of an introduction but in all of this this holy spirit this anointing this fresh oil everything i've been talking about is all about us being vessels remember the earthen vessel that we're a vessel god can fill and so empty vessels to fill 
is what God wants to minister to us. So think of it this way. I'm either full of myself, and who's the biggest enemy we've got? I, we all talk about the devil. It's really ourself. Yeah, the flesh. It's all about me pleasing me. I mean, I, I battle that every day. How about you? Every day I wake up, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Well, I'm thinking about myself a lot of times. I'm trying not. That's why a good. Uh, you'll see this next, maybe in the next week or two. It's a great way to start your day with spiritual things. And the Bible teaches that. It's going to be very clear. You'll see it. But it's not about me. It's about God. And he wants us to be that empty vessel to fill in which he can order. Uh, I mean, didn't Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, says, let this mind that was in Christ be in you? Okay? And then what does it say? He, he, he was equal to God, but what did he do? He, took on, he had made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant. And he was obedient to the cross. So three things. He had no reputation. He's not, he's like, I'm not important. Yet he's God. And he said, I'll be last. That's what it takes. He took on the form of a servant. That means, Marty, you're more important than me when it comes to serving. I'm not, you're not here for me. I'm here for you. That attitude in the church, if it permeated the church, would radicalize the church. I'm talking about across America. If people said, it's not about me, it's about you. Because I want you to be lifted up for God's work. And then, of course, obedience. So this is the vessel that's empty so God can fill us. And that's why we read in here, for it is God which worketh in you both to will, there's the power source, and to do of his good pleasure so that you can become that sweet savior that he talks about. Oh, he's doing my will. I'm pleased with that. Um, you know, people have struggled forever with that, that term. Paul says, work out your own salvation. You ever get that? Oh, the, the, the people who teach you can lose your salvation. Love to go to that verse. Work out. See, you can look. work out. That means you don't work out your own salvation. you got to work on it. No, he didn't say work on your own salvation. He said work out. I love the King James word. Work out because it's in you. It's he were working in you. Now work it out. Let him, let him take control but he can't take control if you're in control. So when you're in, when you're in control, a lot of times this is where you end up. Right here in the valley so he can get you to depend on him. And when we are working out our salvation, then the result is, and it follows the same in Philippians, among whom you shine as lights of the world. Now you become the light source because the power of God is on you. And when the power of God is on you, the light source is bright. It may be dark around you, but the darker it gets, the brighter you shine. God, these, these things are beautiful in Scripture to help us. And I'll conclude with this. Be not drunk with wine. And Brother Chris did a great job in illustrating that, didn't he? I never thought I'd see a six-pack of beer in the church. When he put that up there, I'm like, wow, pastor's not here, man. <laughs> this is going to be, I can't wait to see how this is going <laughs> to. But you know what's amazing? None of us have forgotten it. I mean, his whole point was that it's going to take a six pack for me to get drunk. Maybe some people might be less, but it doesn't matter. The whole point was I got to be filled to be drunk. So he's saying, don't do that. That's of the flesh. Be this, which is filled with the Spirit. I can't be filled unless I'm empty first. And that's where we can say with the psalm, this is one of my favorite verses. You'll hear me say that over and over. Now, everybody knows Psalm 23, but listen. Thou anointest my head with oil. There's that Holy Spirit anointing. Now look what he says. Next verse. My cup runneth over. When I'm empty and he fills me, it overflows. And when it overflows, it affects everybody around us, good or bad. Some people reject it. Some people are drawn to it. That is what God wants in our lives, emptying so he can fill us. So our, we can say when we're filled with the Spirit, my cup runneth over. I hope and pray we can say that this morning. If not, 
let's plug back in with that fresh oil. And we get that power source again to do the will of God and have the joy, have the power to do the things that God wants. With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of um, just gathering as your people to be under your word, the influence of your word. Lord, you, I know that we didn't gather here in vain. And you had a purpose for us, each and every one of us. No matter what it is, you, the Holy Spirit knows what we need individually and collectively help us lord to receive the things that we heard help us to apply it give us the power lord to live it and help lord glorify lift up the lord jesus christ we are so excited about our worship hour may you help us to worship in truth and in spirit may christ be lifted up and all that are present be drawn closer to him i pray in jesus name amen amen